Hello and welcome to week three of this course on international human rights law in Kashmir, prospects and challenges. This week we'll discuss right to freedom of peaceful assembly with our expert speaker, Professor Christoph Haynes. Christoph Haynes is a professor of law at the University of Pretoria. He was a member of the United Nations Human Rights Committee from 2017 to 2020. He is a member of the working group of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights on the death penalty, extrajudicial, summary or arbitrary killings and enforced disappearances. He served as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial, summary or arbitrary executions from 2010 to 2016. He chaired the UN Independent Investigations on Burundi in 2016. Christoph was the lead author of the United Nations Human Rights Committee's General Comment Number 37 uh, of 2020 on the right of peaceful assembly as well as the United Nations Human Rights Guidance on Less Lethal Weapons in Law Enforcement of 2020. He also teaches at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. He has published widely in the field of human rights and is, and is currently developing a database 2020 plus, a program that will tra track the impact of UN human rights treaty system in all UN member states. We're truly delighted to have you today with us, Christoph. Uh, the floor is all yours. Yes, thank you very much, Samir, and thank you to Gaitri as well for organizing this opportunity. There are many reasons why I'm delighted to do this. Um, so uh, Oxford uh, is, is close to my heart. I spend quite a bit of time there as well. Um, and the, uh, the um, subject of peaceful assembly uh, is something that I've been involved in since my doctorate, um, which was on civil disobedience in South Africa, really, 30 years ago. Um, Kashmir, uh, as some of you may know, um, is, is, a, is a, I, I did a country visit in 2012 and I had the opportunity of visiting. And then, of course, the very idea that you are doing this course not for graduation purposes, but simply because you're interested is something that really inspires me as well. Um, and something that I certainly want to support and commend. So um, against that background, I'll be happy to give the, I think you call it the core lecture, um, and speak about the right of peaceful assembly. I believe you will have a seminar afterwards uh, to discuss the application to Kashmir. Um, I, I don't want to pretend that, I was an, that I'm an expert because I spent a, a couple of days there in 2012, uh, but I'm interested by the, this connection. Um, but I, so from my side, what I can do is to give an overview of um, the particular work that we've been doing in the UN on peaceful assembly and on related activities. Um, and then certainly I look forward to questions and comments uh, as well. So perhaps to start off, um, the why I think this topic is so important, why I think peaceful assembly as a topic is interesting, but also very important. Um, and I think that for me that the reason for that is the role it plays in, in the world really today in terms of shaping our societies, in terms of shaping our world really. It's a way of also renegotiating elements of the social contract um, so that if there is something which one experiences as structural violence, perhaps, or even more threatening, um, that this offers one of the alternatives in terms of addressing that. And so I think it's a very integral part of how we live today and, and the structures within which we live, and also a very important part of our agency of being able to do something um, about that. Um, it has become an instrument of choice for, for, for groups um, and for, for the masses, so to speak. I think especially since the beginning of 2000, uh, the beginning of the, of the 20th century. Um, and during this last century, although there were isolated incidences before, it has played a major role in terms of shaping the world in which we live today. One can think of, um, if one starts with Satyagraha in South Africa, later in India, um, if one thinks about the role of uh, peaceful assemblies in my own country, also in the 1950s with the defiance campaign um, and with the rolling mass action of the 1990s and the, the, the anti-apartheid struggle, but also continuing to today for service delivery protests um, that take place and also in the con context of the lockdown. Um, many of the protests that, that are taking place. But this is my perspective here from South Africa. We know that in many other countries, 
Um, it has played an instrumental role in terms of, say, women's right to vote in the UK in the 1920s. Um, it played a, a, a very strong role in the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, I've mentioned the example of, of India, but also in other countries at the end of colonialism, played a strong role. Uh, the end of Soviet style communism um, in the late 1980s, uh, the fall of that particular regime. And then of course, the rise of the environmental concerns. Um, and I think in general also uh, other social causes um, such as LGBTI rights um, and uh, equality issues. And I don't need to remind anyone um, of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, especially of last year um, and anti-war demonstrations that have taken place over time. And in many instances, this has played a significant role in advancing human rights, advancing democracy, in changing society. But at the same time, we should keep in mind um, that peaceful assembly is not necessarily always used to advance those causes. And what happened on the 6th of uh, January, at least it started out as a peaceful assembly in the US um, and in my own country and many other countries as well. One also has examples of peaceful assembly being used to oppose human rights changes. I remember when I did my doctorate um, in, the, in the early 1990s in South Africa, as we were changing from apartheid to democracy, there was a, a huge uh, gathering of farmers coming with their tractors into Pretoria, uh, and I actually heard them in the street as I was finishing my, my doctorate on civil disobedience, which was largely um, about its early history and then um, about the defiance campaign and, and the struggle in South Africa. So it can be used on, on different sides and for many different causes. But the first point I want to make um, is that it has become an important role player in shaping our, our society today. The second point I want to make is why do I think that rules and um, an understanding of peaceful assembly is so important? And in, in this context, why I think the, the uh, instruments that were developed within the UN and so forth um, were significant. Um, I think it's clear that a peaceful assembly often creates a situation where things can go wrong. It's an important um, element in society, it's an important method of participation, but things often go wrong and we need to look only at uh, names such as Tiananmen Square and Sharpeville, um, to, and if we look at what, what is happening um, in Myanmar, uh, even as we speak, and Thailand, Hong Kong, um, we know that in many cases, uh, th there are also instances where deep scars are left because of the use um, of violence um, that, uh, that may erupt. And so it becomes very important then to say that there is a set of rules, uh, a kind of um, code of conduct, uh, rules of engagement, for all the parties in a peaceful assembly, um, not taking away the spontaneity, not taking away uh, the fact that people can pursue new goals through this, but to make sure that there's a clear understanding of the expectations um, of what, what is required. Is something like auth asking authorization, is that required? Um, is there something like organizer responsibility that they must pay for damage? Um, where can peaceful assemblies take place? What actually counts as a peaceful assembly? When may force be used? It's important that those things, that at least the basic rules of the game, that they are set out and that within that, there is some attempt to have a, a, a frame of reference that can be used because obviously in a highly contested situation, both sides will try to find the rules that are most beneficial to them. And then it's important to have global rules that apply in advance um, and over time, so that one knows that these are the standard rules that apply to this sort of situation within which the peaceful assembly can then uh, indeed take place. So, so I think it's important that the international system provides some guidance on this drawing on our experience over, over at least the last century, um, but that one can identify certain flashpoints and try to de-escalate uh, through the um, applicable standards um, that are that, that that apply to such peaceful assemblies, but it's also important on the domestic level 
that this right of peaceful assembly is given content. So as we know, on the international level, the right of peaceful assembly is recognized in Article 21 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and 173 states have ratified that particular treaty. But it's also recognized in other UN treaties and it's also recognized on the, in, in the regional systems um, as a basic right. And on the domestic level, 100 and last time uh, we checked, 184 states have provisions um, for peaceful assembly uh, in their domestic constitutions and then of course laws as well, which are covered by the way in a website in which I think some of you have been involved, um, a website uh, called um, police, uh, uh, peaceful, the right of assembly.info. So that tries to capture the domestic laws, right of assembly.info of all countries in the world. And there's a separate one on the use of force by the police, um, policing law.info that also captures the domestic laws. So these are all attempts to create the framework or define the framework, at least the outer perimeters of the framework within which peaceful assembly um, can take place. So what has happened then in the third place? Um, if we say that this is an important topic, um, that the rules play an important role or a potentially important role. Um, I'm not saying that all the rules are exactly where they should be, but potentially it's important to have proper rules on this. What happened in 2020 on this? So two documents were um, passed um, by the UN adopted after many years. Um, so in the case of the Human Rights Committee, um, we adopted journal comment 37, on Article 21 that sets out what the right of peaceful assembly um, is about, what is its scope, what are its limitations, and so forth. So as you may know, these general comments are authoritative interpretations by the Human Rights Committee, the body that monitors the covenant on civil and political rights, um, in which it sets out its understanding of the right in question. So the Human Rights Committee over the 50 years or so of its existence has done that in, in 37 cases. General Comment 36 was on the right to life. And of course, it's also relevant to the topic that we talk about today. And before that, they looked at also another topic that's of relevance, the right to personal security, freedom of expression as well. Um, and so these are all interpretations, 20 pages. This is the, this is the document, General Comment 37, 102 paragraphs. Um, I can tell you it's 101, it's, it's um, 10,700 words because the UN doesn't allow you to use, if you, if you use one more word, they drop the last one. Um, so that's the parameters within which you operate. So this general comment is then a process uh, or a document that comes out of a process where the Human Rights Committee sit together and say something about the process, but where they then eventually say, this is how we, based on our experience in terms of communications, for example, that reach us or country reports that we consider and looking at the international jurisprudence, this is how we understand this right um, to, uh, uh, to be interpreted. Um, so that's the one document and that's the main one I'll refer to. But at the same time, also July of 2020, um, the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights issued a document called the UN Human Rights Guidance on less lethal weapons in law enforcement. So this is not a committee document. This is an expert document um, that was drafted under the auspices of the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights. In 2014, when I was a special rapporteur on executions, um, I dealt with a number of demonstrations and it was clear to me that the um, basic principles on the use of force and firearms of 1990, while it provides a solid basis on the use of force and in particular on the use of firearms, um, did not, um, became out, out of date really, and did not fully address the issues that are raised by, by less lethal weapons, which in the meantime, since 1990, have been developed. So we then formed a group within the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights, and we then finalized the document. And in 2020, while we were finalizing um, the document, the, the general comment 37, this document then also was issued. So now we have two separate documents, one dealing with peaceful assembly in general. Um, it doesn't really go into the use of force because it refers then 
to this broader document that deals with all uses of force, whether it's in, a, in arrest, for example, by the police or enforcing lockdown regulations or demonstrations. So that is covered by this second document, um, the guidance on uh, the use of less lethal weapons. So I would like to then uh, focus on um, the general comment 37, but I want to emphasize that to understand the, the current law um, and the international standards on peaceful assembly, it's important to see these two documents parallel because use of force issues are, are primarily dealt with in the, in, the, in the guidance on less lethal weapons. So on the general comment 37, so what is a general comment? It's not a treaty, so it's not binding in that sense that states have ratified it, but it's an authoritative interpretation by the body created by a treaty and in, in, uh, empowered by states to actually interpret the provisions of the charter. So it's so-called soft law, but I think it's also important not to make too much of a distinction between hard law and soft law, because one gets certain so-called hard laws, which are very rarely cited, um, and you get soft law instruments, such as the basic principles on the use of force and firearms, which are very often cited, and they the only show in town, really, and they are the ones that actually provide uh, the guidance on how that particular aspect um, of society should be dealt with. Um, and so the, the general comment is then this authoritative interpretation by the body created by states um, that are state parties to the covenant on civil and political rights. Um, and we've seen in the last year since uh, just less than a year since uh, July of 2020, we have seen that the general comment um, and also the guidance on these lethal weapons has been used in many countries around the world um, by their um, police, by NGOs, by the, by the uh, United Nations in assessing assemblies in Latin America, in Asia, in Europe, um, because it has really been in the last year, um, this has been one of the most dominant aspects of international life has been assemblies. And in many of those cases, these documents have been used. And of course, the more they are used, uh, the more they then become um, part of, 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 of custom um, and the harder these legal standards then become. So I'll say something about the content of the general comment and I'll, I'll try to emphasize the most important elements um, of that. Um, but perhaps first something about uh, the process to adopt the general comment. So as I've mentioned, the Human Rights um, Committee um, every few years adopt general comments. Um, it used to take very little time for them to write general comments. I'm told that in the 1960s, it was basically over a weekend and they got together and wrote something to set out their interpretation. But this has changed over, over time. And so for general comment 36, um, I joined halfway through the process, but it was a four year process. Um, in which the half of the committee were replaced by new members and all of us, well, a number of us came in then. And in a way, many of the um, uh, issues had to be redecided by the committee. And so that took quite some time, but it was quite a, a complicated general comment because it deals with everything from abortion um, to uh, euthanasia, to use of force, to, uh, um, to armed conflict and so on. Um, with the General Comment 37, we decided that we want to do it in two years' time because then you don't have a change of membership of the committee. Um, and also because there were so many peaceful assemblies and not so peaceful assemblies ongoing, and we wanted to make sure that we have an impact on what is happening um, around us. So in the first place, what we did was to make it known that we're going to uh, work on a, a new General Comment. And then some NGOs, um, one can almost say, pitched ideas to us. They presented ideas, proposals to the committee and, for example, argued that we should deal with privacy in the next general comment or political participation. We have a general comment 25 on political participation, but part of it is outdated. And there were some other proposals as well. The one on privacy, I think, was a very good one. Um, and if we didn't take assembly, we, we would have taken that one. So it may be a future one that will come up. But I think because of the relevance of the topic, we decided to take peaceful assembly. The idea initially was to take association as well. 
um, but we thought that that's going to be difficult to, to deal with it in two years time. So we specifically focused on assembly. So what then happens is that the Human Rights Committee has a two stage process. There's a reading one and a reading two. And roughly the first reading takes place in the first year and the second, then in the second year. So we first asked states and others to, with any ideas um, that they wanted to present to us about what should go into the journal comment to do so, um, in particular NGOs um, and academics and research bodies and so on, then submit information to us um, and emphasize what do they think are important elements that should be addressed. So we got a very extensive uh, list of submissions there. We had uh, live hearings where NGOs came to Geneva, addressed us as the Human Rights Committee. Um, and then based on that, um, I was appointed as rapporteur. And based on that, I then uh, gave the first draft of the, of the general comment. Um, and one of the issues there that I think is worth focusing on is the structure of the general comment. So in that first draft, uh, I'll say something more about the structure later, but in the first draft, uh, I found that to be one of the most important things is to get the structure right. What are the headings? What is the sequence? And what is the logical buildup of the general comment? Um, so we, we got that more or less right in the first draft, and then we got a lot of inputs, and we started, um, I put that into a draft, which was then submitted to the committee, and we went through it paragraph by paragraph. Um, so the committee um, looked at sentence by sentence, comma by comma, um, and so this is quite an elaborate process, um, almost every day for, for three weeks, uh, where they go through it, and then based on the comments that, um, that we receive, I collect it as rapporteur, and then redraft the document. And then at the end of that process, which was in 2019, um, we then finalized the first draft of the general comment. Now, at the same time, there were parallel meetings of NGOs taking place in many regions in the world, in six or seven regions of the world. Um, there were meetings of people with inputs that they then prepared as well. Um, we had the document translated end of 2019 into Spanish and French as well. And then we got a fresh rounds of inputs into the document at the beginning um, of 2020. And so then um, we, took, we took the new the, 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 the draft that we had, and we took all this new information and went through it paragraph by paragraph. And then as rapporteur, I presented to the Human Rights Committee. These are the proposals about what we should do about paragraph one, or what we should do about paragraph three, or, or notification, or um, online assemblies, or whatever the case may be. And we had several meetings then with regional bodies as well. So the process became quite inclusive um, to, to, to make sure that people are on board, that we know what people propose, um, but also that there's a sense of ownership of the document. Um, and then, of course, COVID struck in March uh, um, of 2020. We were in the middle of our meeting um, and we were just going through the second reading and we had a, a, a sort of a breakaway one weekend where we focused on one issue and that was well on, on two or three but one main issue and that was the question should the right of peaceful assembly also apply online so when people have a meeting like we do now is that protected by article 21 or are you only protected when you have an in flesh uh, concrete in person uh, assembly of course, preparing for it, that's, that's protected even if it's online, but is it eventually required that there must be an in-person meeting as well? And, and many of us, um, I think the majority um, of, of us at the time, at the beginning of the process thought, well, you know, the unique thing about an assembly is it brings people physically together and it says, here I am, um, deal with me, this is how strongly I feel about it, I'm here today. And I still think that's a very important component, but along the way, we, we became convinced and eventually the whole committee became convinced, including myself, uh, and I've changed my mind as we went along. And we said, well, a very important part of the kind of activity that would normally be protected or traditionally be protected by Article 21 now takes place online. The Me Too kind of movement, um, the, 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 the way in which people mobilize politically as well. In many of these instances, 
uh, it, it, it is a, there's a build-up online and then why does it make such a difference whether eventually people then meet in person or whether the whole process takes place online is there a principal difference and it became clear that one is that international law is going to become very outdated if if one does not recognize this changed reality and the fact that it's almost impossible to make a distinction um, or a watertight distinction between um, between online and off the off online and offline world today. So that's just one example of how the process, I think, uh, evolved also on private property. If you deal with assemblies that take place, for example, in malls and so forth, um, on airports, are they covered? Um, a, a very different uh, approach in the first draft to the final draft based on these discussions that we had. All right, so, so what I want to emphasize then is the, is the discussions and the role that this played um, and the role that NGOs played in this. And in the meantime, we had these two websites that I mentioned uh, that we developed and uh, a lot of people gave us information that goes onto the website. And then we were able to go to, to the different countries and see how do they really deal with issues such as the use of force and how do they deal with assemblies in private property and so forth. So not just the international standards, but the domestic ones. And then of course, the, the approach by the NGOs and others as well. So I've mentioned the importance of, of, um, of, of the structure also. So the structure was then to say that there's first a rationale for, for why is the right uh, accepted and why is the right recognized? Uh, what is the scope of the right? What is the nature of the obligation? on states. So once you have the scope of the right, which obligations are placed on states then in terms of protecting that scope? Um, what are the limitations? Can uh, authorization be requ required? Um, the role of the police, uh, when may they use force? And also peaceful assemblies during armed conflict. And then in the last place, the interaction between um, the right of peaceful assembly and the other rights in the covenant. And one element here that, that came out was that if one thinks about notification, for example, notification versus authorization, are you required to inform the authorities before you have a demonstration? Or are you required to ask for permission when you do that? Or should none of these things be required? Now, the European court sees it largely as an administrative element. It's not a restriction. It's not an infringement of the right. The, um, and, and that's a particular approach to it, and that's, that leads to a situation where it's much easier to accept the idea that you can ask for authorization. The Human Rights Committee has a bit of a different tradition there, and it came out in our discussions then uh, very strongly that they said, well, we think this is in conflict with the very idea that this is a right if you have to ask for permission. Um, so the whole question of authorization is not compatible with the, with the right in question. And notification should also only be required if there is a good reason for it. So if you have a spontaneous assembly or if you have a Zoom assembly, you do not need to notify anybody because there's no re requirement of facilitation on the other side. Um, and so in terms of the structure of the document itself, we put notification together with the restrictions, and that means it has to be justified. And authorization cannot be justified. Um, notification can sometimes be justified, but there's a requirement to justify it on the basis of the state. So I think that very structure of the document leads to a situation where you look at restrictions and notification as part of that, and that leads to a very different way of thinking about the right. Instead of putting notification perhaps right at the beginning where it's not seen as, as following on restrictions on the right. So it's, it's, you're almost making some kind of value choices already by just the way you're structuring the document. Okay, so, so we, we've adopted that final structure then. Um, in March of 2020, when COVID struck in the middle of our meeting, we had our last session on the Friday um, after two weeks, and then all of us left Geneva um, back home um, over the weekend. But on that very last Friday, we had a meeting on this question, it, and, and it was scheduled as such, it was not a special uh, scheduling, um, on the question whether online assemblies are also covered. 
And I must say that's very fortunate because then we had a proper opportunity to discuss this in person. And then we took the decision that online assemblies will also in the general comment be seen as part of what is protected by Article 21. And of course, the world has really changed since then. And many, many, including our own meetings, take place online. And I think we would have missed a very significant historical opportunity if we there said, no, we think it must be in person. It's only in person that is protected. And then as, as fate would have it, then our July meeting of 2020 was held online. And there we finalized the first international instrument to be negotiated and to be finalized online. Okay, so let me just point out some of the, this is part of this is the process and then the, the structure itself. What are the main features of the, of the general comment? As I said, it's, it's uh, I think there are eight sections, headings, but there are 102 paragraphs. Um, but there are some elements that run through them that are not necessarily defined as such. But if you look at it and if you pick it up, then you can see that this is a sort of a golden thread that runs through it. Personally, I think, uh, well, let me just say at the beginning that, that uh, I, I should emphasize um, the document is at a, quite a general level, um, as you would have with a 10,700 word document. So it doesn't give detailed expositions of exactly um, how one should deal with uh, the requirements of notification, what should be in the form and those sort of things. It gives a general statement also about demonstrations on public property and so forth. So in many cases, it's not the sort of document that you can simply enact uh, in the local le legislature and think it looks like a, like a law. It's a, it's a general document that then has to be given more content, but it sets the, the general direction. And it sets out also not only what we see as the requirements of international law, it also sets out best practices. So for example, it says that it's good for national human rights institutions to monitor um, instances of peaceful assembly. There's not a legal requirement that they must do it, but we identify it as a good practice. And so it's a mixture of good practices and of, it's mostly legal requirements, but it also has these, these um, good practices there. So what are the, the main, those lines that run through in terms of substance? I think the, the, the one that strikes me most is that if one looks at the traditional approach to peaceful assemblies over the centuries really, um, the, the idea was um, for a very long time that the dividing line between acceptable and unacceptable assemblies is its legality. Is it lawful in terms of domestic law? And so you have that in the 1714 um, uh, uh, Riot Act, British Riot Act, the UK's Riot Act. You have it in the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Um, that if a, a officer deems it necessary, subjectively deems it necessary, because a particular law or order was breached to use force, um, and if he has given, she has given uh, the warnings that they deem fit, then they may use force, including lethal force. That's a very stark uh, exposition of this idea that the difference between acceptable and unacceptable peaceful assembly is whether it's lawful in terms of domestic law. The general comment, I think, in a way crystallizes a different approach that emerged over time and said the important dividing line between acceptable and unacceptable gatherings is not whether it's lawful or unlawful in terms of domestic law. The question is, is it peaceful or is it violent? So it's at the point of violence where it can become unacceptable and where it can be dispersed and where action can be taken. But you see, this moves the, 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 the frame considerably. It's a different way of thinking about it. So for example, what it says is that, and, and this is not just the, the Human Rights Committee that follows this approach. This is more broadly, and we in a way try to, uh, to, to um, capture it in the, in the general comment. You should say the understanding now is that even if you are in breach of some of the the rules concerning procedure. For example, if notification is required and you don't notify, that doesn't make it an unlawful gathering. And even if you are engaged in civil disobedience or direct mass action, that does not in itself make it an unlawful gathering. That question whether or a gathering that is not covered by the right of peaceful assembly. 
that point where it is no longer covered by the right of peaceful assembly comes in when it turns violent. And then, of course, it's important what is considered to be violence and so forth. So it's almost as if what the general comment does is to try to define a box, a certain space within which one can have a certain level of disruption, even some breaches of law, um, which must be accepted, tolerated, indeed facilitated as well by the state, provided it does not go into the into the element of, of being violent. So that's the first, I think, uh, uh, sort of element that runs through. In the second place, the um, general comment has a very broad scope for the right of peaceful assembly. So some of the questions that come to the fore are if there's a lone protest of somebody who stands with a poster, is that person covered? Well, th that that is not covered um, because it's not a gathering. But almost every other gathering is covered, whether it's expressive or not, um, whether it's indoors, whether it's outdoors, whether it's moving, whether it's stationary, whether it's on publicly accessible property, whether it's on private property, in principle it's covered, whether it's offline and, and, or it's online. So it's an extremely broad scope of the right. And then the limitation, but it recognizes this is not an absolute right, there may be limitations on it, and then it defines very closely the standards that these limitations must meet. So there are the language that the general comment use, uses is to say there are limitations on the restrictions that may be imposed. Yes, you may have restrictions, but there's strict uh, uh, limitations on those restrictions. So I think that's the, the second element that runs through the whole thing is a broad scope and then clearly defined restrictions. Then, of course, in the third place, it defines the obligations of the state. Once you are, your conduct is within this protected box, you fall within the scope of the right. What are the obligations on the state? So it then says that um, the state has an obligation not to unduly interfere um, with peaceful assembly. That's the negative obligation. And if states only do that, that's already a major leap forward that they just allow it to happen. That's often where the problems come in, where they don't allow it to happen, they don't accommodate it. But there's also a second element, and that's the positive obligation on the states to um, facilitate and to protect um, assemblies. So facilitate, there must be a legal framework within which assemblies can take place. Um, so if so and, and also if, sorry, is somebody raising the question? Go on, Chris. The microphone that's on. Um, states must also facilitate assembly. So, so they must also um, block off the streets, for example. Um, and that's also a, a term we got actually from the Spanish court, um, Spanish Supreme Court, to say that the use of um, public space or the public space is there not only for circulation, um, but also for participation. So it's a legitimate use of public space, and that must be facilitated and one must be protected. So if there are um, people who attack a peaceful assembly, um, then the state must protect them. Okay, um, and I think those are the cross-cutting um, uh, issues. Um, perhaps just the last one to mention there is that the, that the general comment focuses on the requirement for an individual assessment of, in, of the conduct of individuals. So one should not look at the entire assembly and say this assembly uh, has turned violent and for that reason the entire assembly is banned. That's only under very exceptional cases if it's a serious and widespread violence. But what the authorities must focus on is the conduct of the individuals and any steps that should be taken against violent individuals should be targeted uh, towards them. So individual assessment in terms of whether conduct is violent or not, but also individual assessment in terms of the question whether people can be held responsible, accountable, the organizers, for example, can they be held accountable for damage done by others? So those things cut across. Um, perhaps I should um, I, I should stop there and say that I think based on that one can, of course, um, and perhaps in the question time, we can look at what is the rationale given for the assembly um, the scope, it's important question, when is one dealing with a violent assembly or not, because that's really the important question now, what is considered to be violent, um, the, the nature of the obligations, 
um, and so forth. We can look at that perhaps in more detail. But to con just conclude my presentation, um, so, so what do I think is the potential contribution of this general comment? Um, it has been in, 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 in many um, quarters been widely welcomed. It has been criticized and we can look at that as well. But I do think it helps to give more clarity on the nature of the right, the scope of the right. But I think the most important element is it recognizes that peaceful assembly is a basic right. And the fact that the Human Rights Committee took that on and that there's a lot of publicity that goes around that and back and forth with states and so forth, I think serves to emphasize and to, in a way, claim this box of conduct which traditionally is not that well respected. Either one must comply with what the state does or in extreme cases, people engage in violence. But this means there's a third option between those two extremes that should not only be not be deemed unlawful by the state, but actually facilitated by the state. This is a part of democracy to allow this area within which people can try to renegotiate the social contract. And now the challenge then is, of course, to make sure that it finds its way into domestic uh, laws, into domestic practices as well, um, because that's really once you, if you want to have a common rules of engagement, um, awareness is a very big part of that. And it's only based on such a common sense of what are the rules of this kind of engagement that one will be able to say, yes, we know we can, this is what we can do. We know what to expect from each other. And within that, we are going to try to change our, our system. So let me stop there and thank you very much and uh, certainly open to questions. Thanks a lot, Krista. This was, this was wonderful. Uh, you took us through the process as well as the contents of the, of the general comment. I mean, for us, it's 102 paragraphs, but for you, it's, it's years of work. Uh, great, uh, we are now open to questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question directly, you may raise your hand and then I will call on you to unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, alternatively, you can type your question in the chat and I will read that out, out to Christoph. Uh, let's have Pranav first. Pranav, go. Hi, thank you so much. Very good evening from India. Uh, my question is, sir, uh, the last few years, I've seen an erosion of the legitimacy of international human rights law. So as uh, when you have been dealing with UN institutions, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, has there been a blowback from uh, dictatorial states? Uh, because, you know, a lot of these countries do not tend to respect these rights, even though there is universal uh, legitimacy. So how is that working currently? Thank you. Do you want to take a couple of questions or should I respond directly? You could respond directly. Yes. So, so um, I, I, part of the question I didn't exactly hear, but it sounds to me like the legitimacy of international organizations and of international laws, do states, do, do states actually comply with these standards? Is, did they understand it well? Uh, yes, absolutely. And more, more, more particularly so the authoritarian states. How are yes. they dealing with the Human Rights Committee? Is there a blowback? Are they saying go easy? Uh, how, how does this actually play out in the real world? Yeah, 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 and, and that's a very relevant question, I think, and perhaps two, two elements to, to the answer. Um, people often say, well, international law, it's not like domestic law, there's not a, a, a court and police who back up the, the sanctions. It is more ties of silk, and then when you have an authoritarian state, it's much easier to break those ties of silk, and they, and, and, and they do their own thing. Um, and I think there's there's much truth to that. Um, there's a there's a very uh, strong uh, difference between compliance by by different states if one compares them. Um, and, and and so I think as a starting point, that is indeed the pr the problem that one deals with. I think the value of international law is, is that it sets a standard where then even if you have a, a defiance of the standard or non-compliance, then at least one can measure the defiance. Um, against that standard and one can say one can in a way bring back both the civil society in the in the country itself in some cases the courts or the international community at least have a common piece of paper and a common understanding where they can say well this is the norm and you've you are in defiance of the norm in a, in, a, in a big way if you don't have that norm there's almost nothing you can measure them by uh, 
And so in many cases, it is really ties of silk and it's almost a gravitational pull that one, that one has. But if I think about my own country, for example, South Africa, I think for many years, the international community said this is, there's universal condemnation of these standards. And it's true that, that, that the change in my country didn't come about overnight, it came over time and it became because of activism, but it was largely also articulated through international standards. So apartheid was declared a crime and those sort of things, which then eventually uh, caused the, the society to move in that sort of direction. So I don't think one should make a, a, a too strong claim about the effectiveness of international instruments. One sometimes here, I think Louise Henkin has said, most of the states comply most of the time with most of these rules. It's not really my impression that that, that is the case. I think it's more what you say that, uh, that, that some states that international law has its strongest impact, not so much on the states that are completely human rights compliant, because they have domestic standards that are probably already okay. On the other hand, it has very little influence on the states that are completely off the screen. It still serves a gravitational pull for them, still serves as, as, as a norm, but the middle group of states where there is some kind of sense of the fact that they're part of the international community, I think international law there has the ability to, in a way, serve as a bit of a tiebreaker and, and as, as pulling them in a certain direction in many cases. And, and that's even when I was rapporteur, um, for me, that those were the, the, the situations I aimed at mostly, where at least there's something to work with. Some states are so far out that it's very difficult to reach them. But the second point I want to make is, um, so, so uh, um, right at, at the beginning, uh, Samir mentioned that we are currently engaged in a study on the impact of the UN system. And the truth is that there's very little uh, concrete evidence about the exact impact of the UN system, including the treaty system. And having worked in it myself, one often has the sense that you shoot in the dark. You sit in Geneva and you, you get a case and it goes back and it's very difficult to, to know whether it makes a difference. We now have some uh, follow-up procedures in the Human Rights Committee and some of the other treaty bodies as well. Some of the special procedures have follow-up procedures as well, but all of them are extremely limited. And, and I can say from my own experience, one sits there very frustrated because you, you, you took a decision on a particular issue. Now, two years later on, you get four or five lines of feedback on what has happened there. And this comes through the state and maybe one NGO, or maybe there's not even an NGO voice there and you do not know exactly how much reliance you can put on it. In some cases, yes, you clearly can, but you don't have the full picture. So now the, the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights is engaged in a study to make the impact visible. And so we're doing a study worldwide uh, to, with this algorithm that collects all the information within the UN system, but that's, that's the official documents. But we have people in, potentially in all the countries in the world, all 193 UN states, that will track the impact in the judicial decisions, in the legislature, executive, um, in the media itself, with the National Human Rights Commissions. Teaching is it taught in, 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 uh, in the universities and so forth to get a much better sense because it is a bit like an iceberg with the tip is Geneva, but there's a huge thing under the water, but we have no idea what the format of this is. And I think that's, that's also driven by the by the realization that we need a much better understanding of impact before we can start to, to uh, improve impact over time. But that's, that's the biggest challenge. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, Thank there's you. a question in the chat uh, by Sartak. They say that, unless I'm grossly mistaken, I believe the covenant does not define concepts such as assembly, protest, and demonstration. As such, there exists an overlapping nature between assembly, expression, and association. However, can we say in light of General Comment 37, which evinces a degree of circularity, that it's right to say that associational dimension of assembly are what distinguishes assembly from expression, while the spatial boundedness of assemblies helps differentiate between assembly and association. Yes, uh, so, so it's true that the, the covenant is, is very brief on, on, uh, on peaceful assembly. Article 21 says the right of peaceful assembly shall be protected. So that's it. Um, and then it says how it can be limited. So the word peaceful is used, the word assembly is used, um, but it doesn't say what, it, uh, what, what is understood under those terms. 
Now, of course, over, over time, the Human Rights Committee and the same with, with the regional systems and domestic courts have interpreted when are we dealing with something that's peaceful, when are we dealing with something that's violent, uh, when are we actually dealing with a assembly? And that's the, that's the very question we had. Is an online gathering, is that an assembly? It's peaceful for sure, um, but is it an assembly for the purposes of the act? So then that, that's the reason why we have these general comments is to then give content to these terms in the covenant itself. And then the question is how to distinguish um, the various uh, rights. So Article 19 dealing with freedom of expression, for example, and 22 dealing with uh, association. So with, the, the, and there's clearly, this is, this is something that, that, uh, that uh, occupied us quite a bit. There's clearly a huge overlap between expression and assembly, for example. Um, the, the, the definition we have, this is in paragraph four and six of the general comment, we say that um, peaceful assembly is primarily expressive, but we also recognize that in some cases you can have an assembly which is aimed at in, ensuring solidarity between the participants. In other words, there's not an external audience. So expression assumes an audience, um, but this is in that sense wider than, 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 than freedom of expression. So um, the, the, the distinction between um, assembly um, and, and, and expression, I think then indeed lies in the fact that with assembly, it's a collective, it's a form of collective expression. It's still an individual right, but it's a form of collective expression um, that, one, that, one, uh, 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 that, that one deals with. Um, but because of the large degree of overlap, many of the rules that apply to freedom of expression, for example, um, also apply to peaceful assembly. So the fact that political speech is more protected than other speech also applies to peaceful assembly when it's used with an expressive purpose. So there's an overlap between this right, the right to movement, for example, if you have a, a procession where people walk, it's protected by the right of freedom of movement in addition to expression, in addition to, to Article 21, peaceful assembly as well. Thank you. There's a question uh, by Devangi. They ask that the general comment states that some assemblies can be inherently or deliberately disruptive and require a significant degree of toleration. Could you please elaborate what the committee means by this? I'm not sure that that's, ex that's the exact language of, 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 of the covenant, but, but, but it's in general, that is what the covenant says, is that assemblies can be um, disruptive um, and, and and they still require um, a degree of tolerance they, they still require um, uh, uh, being accommodated and being uh, facilitated and protected so the, the very idea of disruption runs through the general comment um, and what we try to emphasize there is that the fact that an assembly is disruptive in the sense that it stops vehicular traffic for example or commercial uh, engagement, uh, even blocks people from going into shops and so forth, in itself does not mean that it should be regarded as not protected by the right of peaceful assembly. In other words, that it's seen as violence. Because one often hears that argument that states say, well, you are disrupting our economy. Um, you are stopping people in the streets. You are blocking the way here. Um, and for that reason, uh, we say that this disruption amounts to violence and for that reason we can use violence uh, against that. Um, and this is what we try to, to emphasize also where one deals with the ground of restriction um, of assemblies based on, um, on, uh, uh, on law and order is that you cannot simply say because this is disruptive it is not protected under Article 21. So this is the, the box that I spoke about that one says protected conduct um, that the conduct, even if it's disruptive, it falls within the right of peaceful assembly generally. Now the question, and we had a very long discussion on this, the, the question comes up, what if you have um, disruption beyond a certain point? What is the point? Where, and is there a point where you can say that something that remains completely peaceful um, becomes so disruptive that at some point it can be, it can be stopped by the, uh, the state and it can be dispersed. Uh, 
So there's one example, I think it was Peru, where they had 75 days where a highway was blocked completely peacefully. Um, and so the question was then, in, in most uh, cities in the world, if that happens, do you expect states to accept that and not to act against them at all? So there's very little authority on this. Um, we went back actually to a report that I did with the uh, Mina Kiai, the Special Rapporteur on Peaceful Assembly 2016, in which we said um, that if the disruption is serious and sustained, now we don't say 75 days, but we say if it's serious and sustained, then this, uh, this particular uh, assembly may, in the extreme cases, be dispersed. But we also say then um, that uh, in doing so, um, no nothing more than minor injuries um, may be imposed. So typically tear gas would be used in such cases, but that's a very extreme case. What the point that we want to make is that a certain, a certain level of disruption comes with the recognition of peaceful assembly. There is a very interesting uh, question that Raj has uh, has asked. It is about a very, very recent order of the Department of Higher Education in India, uh, mandating public sector undertakings, universities, which are publicly funded, to seek approval of the Ministry of External Affairs before organizing online conferences, seminars, webinars on matters which constitute internal uh, issues, including, for example, this core lecture, uh, because we are talking about peaceful assembly and Kashmir. Uh, such has been the arbitrariness of the order that even links of such events have to be shared with the ministry. Do you see this order living up to the minimal human rights standards of one's right to freedom of peaceful assembly, even though virtual? This is very interesting because I'm always looking for an example um, of where online assemblies are are restricted in this way. So I'll definitely, I'll be very interested to follow up on this as a concrete example. This is the typical kind of situation that, that we are very concerned by. Um, so let me go one step back. One of, the, one of the questions we asked ourselves is if you are going to recognize that um, online assemblies are fully protected under Article 21, do you then also recognize that the restrictions on peaceful assembly will come online and will apply as well. And this to me was one of the concerns, one of the reasons why initially I was not very much in favor of recognizing online assemblies as protected by 21. But the, 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 the thought process that made me change my mind is that you can ask for something like notification, which this, this uh, well, this is even more than notification, it's to seek approval, which we generally say is, is unacceptable even for in-person uh, assemblies. But to, to notification itself is justified at best by the, the need to allow the authorities to um, facilitate the assembly. So if you're going to have a thousand people walking down the main street, it's reasonable to say, well, the authorities must be able to block off the streets and not cause uh, accidents and so forth. So you, you cannot simply arrive uh, for such major events that cause social disruption at a certain level. Yes, you can have some notification, but you don't, oh, it, it's very difficult to think, how can you have this kind of consideration applicable to online assemblies? Um, it's not a disruption of the, of the traffic or any other uh, such public cause to have an online assembly. So to have a, a requirement of approval, that in the first place, that's very problematic from the point of view of the general comment, but even notification of online assemblies I think are usually problematic because it's very difficult to see the rationale for that. And that goes back to the idea that a notification is a restriction, um, at least as far as the general comment sees it, and restrictions must be justified. So what can be the justification for, for that sort of requirement? But I'll be very interested to, to, uh, to, 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 know, to know more about this particular uh, incident. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, we, we'll share the, the order of the Ministry of uh, Higher Education with you post the lecture. Uh, now let's turn to questions, live questions. So we have Salman Khan first. I would request you to keep your questions brief. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samir. Thank, uh, thank you, Professor, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. I got a two-part question. One, um, dealing with the, you mentioned in your um, in your lecture, one thing very uh, important there that uh, when just before the COVID, uh, you were having a session 
uh, General Comment 36, and there was a participation of NGOs. Those are accredited by the United Nations. They were, they were there and there was a part of participation to place, the session took place. One, what type of influence did the civil society play? One, secondly, I'm asking under the pretext of a disclosure come in over 200 pages report about the India Chronicle and your disinformation lab where India has actually instigated or taken over over a dozen of the NGOs, redundant NGOs in the EU and on the preface, but it was, they were the French European NGOs, but it was backed up by Sirvas group from India that was funding. Uh, so how do you vent God? How do you vet in the future? Because now it is open and it is, it is under the investigation. So because they do play an integral part, the civil society do play an integral part in as an input. Uh, so that's one of my question. Secondly is when we talk about the UDHR Article 20, which is the right of uh, assembly and association, then we have ICCPR say, uh, Article 21, which is also talk about the same, the, uh, you know, the right of assembly and right of the association. And then we have a general comment, which is eight section, 120 paragraph and 10,000 word, but it's suppressed. It's suppressed by the local law. So. I mean, you have all the beautiful law, but then you, you know, it it has become suppressed by if there is a local law which over to supersede these laws, international convention. So, uh, uh, how do you deal with it? I mean, any good law can be suppressed or supersede by the local law. Thank you. Yes. So, so the first question, uh, I understand it to relate to the influence of NGOs on the process. Um, I must say our experience has been, has been with at least with this general comment 37 has been very positive with the input of, of NGOs um, who want to, in a, in a responsible way, want to make sure that the right is as well protected as possible. Um, I, I personally didn't pick up any instances where we had the impression that, that an NGO was, was a, I think it's sometimes called a gongo, uh, that they were trying to come up with, with a different agenda. But, but I must also emphasize that the, the um, that, that states have a direct access to us as well. We, we met with states, they gave us uh, inputs, oral inputs and, and very extensive written inputs, uh, 20, more than 20 states, uh, three of them members of the, of the permanent, uh, of, of, of the Security Council permanent members. Um, so we take, we take opinions from all these different uh, uh, sources. But eventually we then decide on what to use and what not to use. Um, and this is largely an attempt to establish the legal framework and to establish best practices. So um, in going through the inputs uh, as a rapporteur for each one of these paragraphs, I would say we have the following inputs and um, give the gist to the committee members. And then we would say with these two or three, we agree. Uh, and with the, the others, we simply uh, uh, let go. So the committee itself is independent uh, and they listen to all sides, but eventually uh, this, is, this is a completely independent process. So yes, uh, NGOs have a, have a possibility of input, but this is screened by the, by the committee, if I if I, if I'm understand your question well. The second one is the, the question of domestic law suppressing uh, uh, or, or being more powerful than international standards. Of course, here one, one should recognize, as we did, earlier that this is also not interna hard international law, this is soft international law, so there is a question about its uh, exact enforceability uh, in the courts, but that is exactly the, pro the issue we raised uh, in, the, in the first question, is that international law at least sets out a standard, um, and in, in, in many instances where, where if a state does not want to follow these, uh, these general comments, it may not do so in a particular case, but it remains the, the international standard and the next year or the year after they come back and eventually in, in, some, in many instances, um, this exercises a gravitational pull towards uh, accepting what these standards are. It also gives the, the, the courts, and we've seen this now in a number of Latin American countries where the guidance on less lethal weapons is quoted. And they say, well, this is an expert document, but there is no other international standard in terms of which a state can say we are following the international rules. So in the end, they often come back to that. But there's no guarantee that international standards will prevail. And that's just the nature of the, of the beast because of state sovereignty and because we don't have a world government, which is probably a good thing that we don't have a world government that enforces it uh, 
in all countries in the world because that will create all kinds of other power struggles as well. But that, that's the that's a, that's one of the constraints of international law. Thanks, sir. Uh, Pranav, you can go next. Thank you, Professor, for an interesting lecture. Uh, my question pertains to uh, whether hologramic protests which took place in Spain and uh, South Korea uh, uh, fall within the ambit of Article 21. You spoke at uh, you spoke that uh, you spoke about uh, virtual assemblies uh, and whether they constitute assemblies, and the committee discussed it at length. What do you think is the position position with respect to uh, hologram protests? Thank you. Yes, that's very interesting. So yeah, as you mentioned, 2015 in Spain, in front of the parliament building, they had these holograms that looked like demonstrators who are marching. Um, and in fact, we built that into, uh, into the world moot court uh, problem of last year, the Nelson Mandela moot in Geneva, um, because we wanted people to use the, the journal comment. Yes, I think it's, it's once one takes the step of saying how broad the scope is of the right of peaceful assembly. And once one says, that it, uh, it can entail physical presence, but it can also be digitally done. Whether it's an online kind of assembly or whether it's a, a hologram, uh, I think it's in principle, it's protected um, by Article 21. So that's certainly, that's, we had that discussion and that was certainly factored into, into the approach taken, taken by the committee. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, from Shub. Uh, she first thanks you for your lecture and your work, especially in Kashmir. Uh, could you speak to the situations where the right to peaceful assembly is violated by states using disproportionate force, specifically the situation in Kashmir where India has used excessive MRT force against peaceful protesters going back to 1990 and more recently using pellet guns? What possible actions can the international human rights institutions take when India violates the right to peaceful assembly on a continuing basis. Armed Forces Special Powers Act, for example, dates back to 1958, so it was first introduced in Kashmir in 1989, 1990. Yes, um, and, and as I said in my report after my visit in 2012, um, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, so I think it was Article 4, uh, which says that any law or order that's disobeyed may justify this use of force. Uh, which is very far away from what the international standards require. But there's also the second element, uh, it's, and it's, it's uh, Article 7, I think, which says it's, it's an ouster clause, um, that nothing can be done in the courts when this happens. And, and the problem with that is that you have the right to life, the substantive part that is not protected, but also the procedural part, the accountability part that is expressly uh, excluded. And I think that's why it's so... so uh, um, so concerning when in the in the in the so-called disturbed areas it's a, like a mini state of emergency that is declared on a permanent basis it's not it's not uh, regularly reviewed as well um, and it does not comply with those uh, um, principles on when states of emergency may be may be declared um, so i think together with the what is, is it the civil procedure code uh, I think it, it creates a, a problem of, 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 of a very low protection um, for, for the right to life in its substantive and its normative uh, position. India is not the only country in the world where that is the case. If you look at the, at the website that I referred to earlier, of course, the other countries as well. But that, that makes it even more urgent. What can the international system do about that? Um, and I think it's or, or what can be done in general about it. I think it's, it's in the first place, there's the question, what can the international system do about it? So I think it's important that these issues remain on the agenda with the UPR. It remains on the agenda within the treaty system, special procedures. Um, even though some of these visits are quite confrontational, it is important that, that this international engagement remains. But I think in addition to that, there are also the, the work that can be done on the domestic level. And within the courts, um, and I, I, I mentioned in my report of 2012, a number of instances where, um, where especially the Supreme Court in India has taken a fairly progressive uh, approach and com commissions of inquiry as well. There are every now and again, these openings in the domestic system that can and should be used um, to, to, as, as we know, the right to life has been widely interpreted in India, um, and the, these, these openings in the judicial system and with national human rights institutions, those should be used. And then, of course, the, the, the importance of civil society 
uh, I've, I've always been struck by how important it is, even if one talks about the international uh, um, engagement, unless there are people on the ground who are pulling in the same direction, you are probably not going to move anything from the international side. And the most important element then, I think, is those who are on the ground. And whether it's through peaceful assembly or through, through uh, strategic litigation, um, I think those are, the, those are the forces that eventually do change uh, or has the best potential to change uh, systems around. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Bhavni. She asks, could you elaborate on the individual assessment that the authorities are supposed to carry out before responding to violent acts within the assembly? Because oftentimes the authorities resort to disproportional me measures against the assembly as a whole without having regard to who the real perpetrators are within the group. Yeah. So, so the general comment um, emphasizes that uh, force is, is uh, as, as we said earlier now, this mere disruption, pushing and shoving, that's not force. Um, force entails um, physical, the use of physical force um, that has the, is likely, or does uh, cause injury or death or serious damage to property, then, then one is dealing with force. Now, that force, if, it's, if, if there's a group of a thousand people and there are 10 people who are using force in that sense, then they should be isolated and dealt with separately, targeted intervention. So whether it's a rest um, of those individuals, if they are engaged in violence, uh, the law should take its, its course as far as they're concerned. So it, it can be arrest of those individuals. In some countries, they use containment, which is something you may want to discuss with Mainakia. He's not so, so keen on that ever being used, but some countries do that. The problem is they also abuse it sometimes for 13 hours. They, uh, in one particular case, um, they encircle a particular group um, and keep them separate. They can't go to the bathroom, anything like that. That becomes actually a detention, a form of arbitrary detention then but some, uh, some targeted focus on the individuals. And so what one wants to avoid and what the general comment uh, steers away from is to say, because there are 10 people out of a thousand who are violent, that the entire group is dealt with in the same brush and there's a blanket ban on, on well, that assembly is dispersed and there's a blanket ban on assemblies. So arrest and pro properly deal with the individual's uh, concern either because they use force, uh, direct force themselves, or because they are deemed to be violent. So deemed to be violent, uh, it's, it's quite open for abuse, but, but it includes in cases where there's clear evidence that they intend to use violence, or whether violence is imminent on their side, or whether they incite violence. So those are also instances where um, where states may deem them to be violent and then act against them because they are unprotected. But even, in, and that's the, that's the last point I should make, even in cases where people lose the protection of Article 21, there, there used to be a, a, a phrase in the UN which said, well, they are no longer protected. But, but I think that's very wrong. And, and this, is, this has fortunately changed in the last few years because you're no longer protected by Article 21 but you are still protected by the other provisions, your right to life, your right to um, a fair trial, all those things, and right against excessive use of force, which is a form of cruel and human degrading treatment or punishment. You retain all those rights, even if you become individual, uh, even, even if you're individually violent. Um, so I think the, 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 the point is in the first place, targeted uh, intervention. And then even with those targeted interventions, what is stated in the general comment and also in the guidelines uh, on the use of force and in the basic principles on the use of force and firearms is that whenever force is used, it must comply with a number of standards, the legality principle, there must be a legal basis, but it must also be necessary, not all necessary force, the force must be necessary, uh, graduated use of force, if you can use less force, you must use less force, it must be proportionate, um, it must not be discriminatory, it must there must be precautions. So if you can avoid a situation from arising where force would be used, you should do it. And there must be accountability afterwards. So even when force may be used, there are six requirements that are posed for every individual use of force. And again, the individual use of force must be emphasized because, for example, to use um, fully automatic weapons, 
um, in any situation of, of, of demonstrations are by their very nature, um, the force is not necessary because you cannot consider um, the question whether each different round that he shot was necessary. It's in fully automatic mode. So that can by definition not be necessary. But I, I'm particularly interested in also those who are on the, on the ground using the guidance on, on less lethal weapons in their daily work, because I think that again provides a common standard of reference that at least provides some kind of, of, of benchmark against which uh, um, police action can be measured. Thank you. There's a question from Ashwari. My question is, since you you know mentioned that the right to peaceful assembly is also a recognized basic right online now, what happens when states try to encroach upon them through their own domestic data laws uh, and even go to the extent of imprisoning people for what they write on Twitter or you know toolkits they create, etc. Yes, yes. So, 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 so that, that's that's a, dealt with in particular in the general comment the, the issue of data privacy. Um, of course, there's the whole issue of internet shutdown and so forth as well, but also mass surveillance um, and then individual surveillance. So the, the restrictions, the the ability of the state to restrict um, in online activity in general, including peaceful assemblies, because in a way every online is, uh, every um, online meeting would then be an assembly um, is subject to the to the privacy the international standards on on privacy laws so it must be publicly known it must be impartially enforced and so forth so any restriction on peaceful assembly must comply with those with those standards so yes it's recognized that the right is is available online and then any restrictions must comply with with those requirements Thank you. There's a question by Sajid. Uh, Professor, is there any limitation under international human rights law on a peaceful assembly which may last indefinitely? As recently, the Supreme Court of India banned a protest which was going on in the capital of the country against the Citizenship Amendment Act, which targets Muslims. The Supreme Court cited the reason, and I quote, we have to make it unequivocally clear that the public ways and public spaces cannot be occupied in such a manner and that too indefinitely democracy and dissent go hand in hand, but then the dem demonstrations expressing dissent have to be in a designated uh, place alone. Is this ruling inconsistent with ICCPR and the general comment on peaceful assembly? Yeah, so that's the issue I mentioned earlier where we had the discussion about uh, um, a peaceful assembly, if it's it, it remains completely peaceful and it lasts for a very long time, at what point can one cut it off? And there's very, there's very little, jurisprudence on that point where you can say exactly, should it be two days, should it be five days and so forth. So the, the in principle states may regulate, regulate uh, the time, space and manner of assemblies, but that, uh, that is subject to the, the, the reasonableness of the limitations that are imposed. Um, so time, uh, under the heading of time, the general comment says that generally assemblies should be allowed to, um, to conclude voluntarily. They should be al allowed to continue as long as people wish. At the same time, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the general comment also recognizes that there is a point at which a completely peaceful assembly um, can, be, uh, can be declared unlawful and dispersed by the, by the authorities. And we don't give it a, a, a time frame there, but I mentioned the the 75 days example from Latin America and the standard there, it's, it's, uh, it's again this, uh, a general standard, um, which as you know, with the, the entire general comment consists of general standards, but the, the term used there, if, if it's um, um, uh, uh, serious and sustained, um, and that leaves some room within societies to, to um, to determine what they would really see as sustain. And I think what plays a role there is what is the level of, of disruption? Um, does it, for example, disrupt emergency vehicles? Um, does it disrupt the main highways in the streets with no alternatives? Does it present um, threats to the rights of others? Because that's recognized in the covenant. Um, so if schools are blocked, that kind of thing, that comes into play. And all of that has to go on the scale 
to decide what is a serious and sustained disruption, um, but in particular in the question, does it affect the rights of others? But we want to emphasize that the mere fact that there is a um, disruption of economic activity and, and, and disruption of vehicular activity in itself, unless it becomes serious and sustained, does not warrant uh, the dispersal of an assembly. Thank you. I know we still have a lot of questions in chat and especially directly messaged to me. And we will not be able to take all of them in the short span of time we have. We have paused them and we will deal with them during the during the seminar. Uh, but there is one question that I uh, will sort of uh, highlight here. It's by Wasim and they say, you visited India in 2012. Uh, can you please briefly tell us about your op observations and experiences during your visit in relation to Kashmir? Has there been any follow-up since? Yeah, so, so, so the, the, um, the, the practice in the mandate on extrajudicial executions is that two years after the visit, one does a follow-up report. Uh, you don't go back to the country um, because you try to do two countries per year, two new countries per year. That's a two-week visit. Um, on its own. And so in, the, in those two weeks, I think I was in, in, in six states in, uh, in India. And so one travels a lot while you're there. Now, two years later, just in terms of physical capabilities, one is not able to go and do an assessment yourself again, but then you do a desk-based assessment. Um, and the, so this was 2012, then two years later, we did an, uh, I did an assessment which I presented to the Human Rights uh, Council. And to a large extent, the problems uh, in, in, in Kashmir remained, the same issues that were raised there. Um, I was also told uh, when I was there in 2012 that many of the issues that I raised um, were receiving attention. Um, the, the, uh, the, the question of the declaration of disturbed areas that this is constantly under review and so forth. Um, it didn't seem to be something which, uh, which materialized uh, two years later. So that was the, the, the last time that I, that I myself uh, engaged with, with, uh, with the situation there. Thank you. We'll have the last question by Mohammed Sikandar. Hello, sir. Sir, uh, during the recent past, there have been instances uh, where protesters have been targeted by the establishment on the basis of the media report. And uh, uh, it creates a sort of uh, conflict between uh, uh, privacy and at the same time reporting by the, uh, by the media coverage. Doesn't the, the right of privacy extend not to be covered by the media journalists, especially in circumstances where the establishment may target the protester later on? Okay, so, so, so those who participate in the assembly, whether they have a right to privacy against the media covering them, uh, because there may be retaliation against them afterwards. And I suppose that would extend also to, to, to them being filmed even by the authorities. Yeah, so, yes, of course. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, 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 the question of being filmed by the authorities is a, is, is, is a real one. Um, the, the general comment deals, for example, with face masks. Um, not, not, not directly in the context of COVID, but people wanting to put up face masks for various reasons. They want to look like Margaret Thatcher or they want to protect their privacy, which is, which is uh, to your point, um, and, and prevent retaliation. Um, and the general comment recognizes that one, that one can do that, that um, because in some countries they prohibit you from, from wearing a face mask to protect your privacy. The general comment expressly says that you have the right to protect yourself. Um, it, also, it also says that the state should not take any actions uh, that create a chilling effect. Um, it does not expressly say that there's not a right, to, that there's a right to privacy, they cannot, uh, uh, they cannot film it, but it does recognize that you cannot, um, that the state cannot um, impose measures that have a chilling effect on assemblies, and this would typically be a case, I would think, if the idea is to put, take out the camera so people know that they that they can be um, that they can be persecuted later um, by the state. Um, that that would be a chilling effect by the state. A, a more complicated question is where the press film um, the assembly because it's not the state itself um, that is responsible. It is 
the public or a member of the of the media who's filming it and whether one has a right against that. Um, the general comment does say that um, that the right of privacy continues um, even if you're in a public space uh, in principle. Um, and so I think it's it's as far as the state is concerned, it's clearly defined in the general comment that your privacy remains. You right in principle, your right to privacy remains. It's more difficult to say uh, that the media that the media must be prohibited from covering it. There, there, I would say the the obvious solution is to cover one's face and to to protect one's own privacy that uh, through through by doing that. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I have received a few requests to see if we can continue this conversation uh, for a few minutes uh, past two. It's already time. And Christoph, Christoph, you have a few more minutes to take some more okay. questions. Good. Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, those of you who uh, want to be, please, uh, you can leave at any point of time. There is a question from Moeen. He says, ICCPR uses the words shall, but the general comment uses the words must and require. Is there an underlying implication that the general comment is legally binding? Also, general comment uses external references to treaties that many states are not a party to. Can this not be seen as human rights committee making states be bound to other treaties that they never signed in the first place? And secondly, the general comment leaves out any reference to permissibility of foreign support and or funding in peaceful assemblies. Does it leave it to the states to decide that? Yes, I, I should mention, I just see my laptop at 6% uh, on, on the battery, but, it, but that, that, should, that should still last us a few minutes. Um, yes. Um, on, the, on the question of, um, there's a, there's, there is a provision, there's a reference to foreign uh, uh, funding, that it should generally not be prohibited. I'll, I'll have a look at what the number is, but it's, it's in, a, in one of the paragraphs. Um, and then the question of shall and must. Um, so the, the, of course, the treaty itself is, is binding, um, but the general comment uses both um, uh, uh, shall and should really, um, and must not in some cases. So where we try to use shall is where we say there's a clear legal obligation. So for example, the committee has ruled on this before, um, and this is well established also in terms of, of, of custom. Uh, there we, where we think there's a legal uh, obligation, we say uh, shall. Um, where we say should is uh, where we think it's best practice. Um, so for example, we say that, um, that those who, uh, that, that it's good practice for those who organize assemblies to have marshals, but this is not required because it sometimes happens that states then say you can only have an assembly if you have your own marshals and see the human rights committee said that you must have your own marshals. So we don't say that's a requirement. There, there we use the word should. So there's a, there's a very careful uh, attention paid to some instances where we say should and, and some instances where we say shall. Thank you. Uh, I'm conscious that we are over time and the battery is also about to die. Uh, great. Thanks a lot, Christoph, for this wonderful lecture and answering questions so brilliantly. Uh, uh, we will have the seminar for this week uh, on Saturday, 6th of March, 2021 at 12.30 p.m. GMT or 6 p.m. IST. Uh, thanks a lot, Christoph, and thank you, everyone, for, for your wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to participate and I hope to see some of you in person at some point.